who? It's just who I am. I just can't help myself. I've tried. Oh, believe me, I've tried. You see, I want to, every now and then at least, be the one arguing with the customer service agent, telling him how unreasonable he's being. I want to be the one calling up my local politician's office and giving her a piece of my mind. I want to be the one who stands up to the guy sitting behind me, screaming unceasingly at the players on the floor during the entire game for no good reason. But alas, I don't. Or at least 90% of the time. Instead, I think things like, well, this customer service agent's just doing his job. The politician represents so many different constituencies other than myself, I understand. It's obvious this guy sitting behind me has some significant stuff going on to be this upset about a game. That's what peacemakers do. We tend to see multiple sides of an issue, thereby having empathy for a variety of responses. I guess the point I'm wanting to make is when I have to call customer service, I ask my wife Marion to do it. <laughs> I do see peacemaking, though, at least for the most part, as, as a gift. Or at least that's what all the personality assessments I've taken indicate. In fact, it's usually in the top three attributes. Except that someone who's constantly trying to broker peace, I'm also keenly aware of a peacemaker's downfalls, too. Like the fact that we can end up trying to make so many people happy that in the end, no one is ever really happy. And we can compromise so much of our own values and beliefs that we're left without any real clear sense of any values or beliefs. And we can spend so much of our time trying to keep the peace among others that we never find any real true sense of inner peace for ourselves. Which I can't help but wonder is at least in part Jesus' point in our reading from Luke this morning. But let's be honest, this isn't exactly what we expect to hear from the one we call the Prince of Peace. I came to bring fire to the earth. And oh, how I wish it were already kindled. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five and one household will be divided, three against two, two against three. They'll be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. The first time I re remember reading these words as an adolescent, I didn't get it. After all, up to that point, I always sort of thought of Jesus as a peacemaker too. I mean, he healed people and, and cast out demons. He hung out with those who were sick and aging and grieving and the outcast. One colleague said that she used to imagine that if Jesus were living today, he'd, he'd be a pretty cool, mostly laid-back guy. You know, wearing Tom's shoes, a cup of Starbucks in one hand, posting on social media with his iPhone in the other. In fact, he'd probably be trending on Twitter. Hashtag Jesus is awesome. And I can understand where she's coming from. After all, just a couple of chapters ago, he's saying things like, do not worry about tomorrow. Instead, consider the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. If they're precious in God's sight, well, then so are you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to, to give you the kingdom. Quite frankly, I prefer this Jesus with his gentle hipster ways and kindly prose, referring to us as precious and part of God's little flock. But deep down, I think we all know that peacemaking just isn't that simple. Whether it's with individuals or countries or even within ourselves, it's not just about saying nice things and being kind to each other. No, real peacemaking can be, well, downright hard. In fact, the truth is there's usually pain before there's progress, crisis before contentment, fire 
before freedom. Or at least that was my experience as a child. I remember I, growing up, I got splinters all the time, it seems. I was constantly coming in from outside to have them removed by my mother, and, and she was a masterful surgeon, carefully prying them out with, with a needle and tweezers. But before she'd do so, she always would take a match and light it and burn the tip of her tools. I can remember asking her one day, why, why do you do that? She said, well, the, the fire sterilizes the needle. That's the thing about fire. Yes, we're all too familiar with the destruction it can cause. We see it every day. And houses destroyed and forests cleared and third degree burns. And yet fire simultaneously has a purifying effect, a refining attribute, a transformative power. You see, sometimes fires burn, but don't destroy. Or at least that's the case over and over again in Scripture. I mean, think back to Moses' encounter with the burning bush at the foot of Mount Sinai. This experience leads Moses to a place of conflict with the Pharaoh and the overthrow of Egypt, but also the liberation and freedom for God's chosen people. This is a fire that burns, but doesn't destroy. In the book of Daniel, the young boys Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego find themselves facing execution by an angry king Nebuchadnezzar because they wouldn't worship the king's idol. They're thrown into a fiery furnace and yet are left unharmed. When the king looks into the blazing furnace, he doesn't see the destruction of three boys, but his eyes are transformed as they're opened to the presence of God. This is a fire that burns, but doesn't destroy him. The prophet Malachi refers to God, the refiner, who sits by the fire. The process of refining a precious metal removes all the impurities from the precious metal to enable it to be molded and shaped, free from things that mar and deform the metal that lessen its value. The refiner is attentive and deliberate, carefully watching the silver as she holds it in the fire until the silver is purified. This is a fire that burns, but doesn't destroy. In fact, we don't just read about it in Scripture. No, it's a truth so deeply embedded in all of creation that I think we sometimes forget it. I was reminded of this recently after reading about many of the forest fires that have taken out place out west the last several years. Apparently, a forest that's affected by fire experiences something called plant adaptation. In this, plants and trees often adapt to be more resistant to fire in the future. They become stronger and more resistant in the face of danger. Additionally, there's increased growth in the forest after a fire. The heat from the fire triggers the dormant pine cone seeds to pop open and land in the charred and ashy soil, which is a mysteriously rich soil for new life to burst forth. Environmental experts are now realizing the importance of fire for the pruning and regeneration of forests. Fire is important to enable new life and new creation to burst forth from the earth. Of course, you don't need to be an environmentalist to know this truth. I mean, you know this fire too. After all, if you're alive in this world, you've walked through it and watched those you love endure it. Like the woman who lives in an abusive relationship with her spouse in order to keep the peace but never really feels at peace until she walks through the fire of leaving? Or the teenager who stays in the closet to keep the peace in his family, but never is able to find the true peace of being oneself until he walks through the fire of, of coming out? Or the son who keeps his mouth closed about his father's racist jokes to keep the peace in the family, only to discover he was never fully at peace until he told his dad how he really felt? They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. 
few years ago, a congregant at the time came to me worried about an re experience she recently had. She'd been with a group of friends out to dinner one evening when the conversation turned toward an Islamic mosque that was slated to be built nearby. Of course, the process had been delayed for months and the Muslim community in that area were getting resistance at, at every turn. This congregant's friends began chastising the idea that a mosque could be built in this country, especially in their community. They started calling Muslims derogatory names, referring to all of them as extremists and terrorists. She said to me, I, I didn't agree with my friends how awfully they were referring to them, the names they were calling them, the stereotyping, the, the broad brushstrokes. It just didn't seem fair. But I didn't say anything. I didn't want to stir the pot. You know, I, I wanted to keep the peace. Nathan, did I do the right thing? Jesus says in our reading today, I didn't come to bring peace. But I think that perhaps the better translation here is, I didn't come to keep the peace. I mean, just think about his ministry throughout the Gospels, and you can understand what he means. He turns over the tables in the temple. He's always in conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees. He eats with people he shouldn't. He heals when it's forbidden. He raises people from the dead. Jesus is constantly playing with fire. What else do you think puts him on a cross. Because you see, Jesus is after something greater than keeping the peace. In fact, Paul refers to it in his letter to the Philippians when he describes it as the peace of God which is beyond our understanding. It's no wonder everyone thought Jesus was crazy. It's no wonder when people are after this kind of peace in our world today, we call them crazy. It's hard to understand. And you know who I'm talking about. Like the neighborhood activist who catches fire and goes to work to clean up a block in our city after a child dies in a drive-by shooting. Or the senior citizen set ablaze who single-handedly takes on the state legislature to make it easier for elders to purchase at a reasonable cost the prescription drugs they need. Or the elementary student who's inflamed by her congregation that they won't be more environmentally conscious and lobbies them to be more green. We look at such individuals in their zeal and their passion and we say, what a big hot mess. But then again, Persephone had to descend into the underworld to marry Hades before spring could be reborn. And Dr. Faust has to sell his soul to the devil to achieve power and knowledge. And Sleeping Beauty has to sleep for a hundred years before she can get the prince's kiss. Richard Rohr says it like this, the way down is the way up. Jesus says it a little bit differently. You have to die in order to live. Because you see, fire is always coming. We cannot prevent it. There are flames in your life and mine right here and right now. The only question is, will we allow them to destroy us? Or will we trust in God's goodness to do as God has promised from the very beginning? To kneel down to the ground, to scoop up the ash and the dust, and to breathe new life. into us.